Greg, you are diving into yet another fascinating topic, this time the intersection of rock and roll and faith. What in the world made you want to, I love this topic, what made you want to do it? Well, to quote the great theologian, Joan Jett, I love rock and roll, okay? So let's start there. I've always been a fan of rock and, and pop music and pop culture. Uh, you know, as a kid, I grew up watching television. I wasn't a big reader. I've become a reader since then. I actually read these books behind me. They're not props. But, but so I've always had an interest in pop culture. Okay, combine this with the fact that I am an evangelist. And an evangelist builds bridges to culture. Uh, here's an example. The Apostle Paul brought the gospel to the people of Athens on Mars Hill. At that time, Athens was the intellectual and cultural center of the world. It took time to walk around in their city that had, had idols everywhere. They had these monuments uh, to these various deities. And, and just in case they miss one, uh, they erected a monument to the unknown God. So Paul gets up at the Areopagus. That's like the town square. And he says, hey, I was walking around your city. I see you guys are very religious. Today we might say you're very spiritual. He says, I notice an altar erected to the unknown God. I want to talk to you about him. That's called building a bridge. Then Paul quoted one of their secular philosophers to make his case. So, so this book is not a glorification of rock music or rock stars. It's sort of like pulling the veil back and seeing what's there. And what you find are people that are just like us, people that are searching for meaning in life. But at the same time, these are extraordinarily talented people. Uh, people that breathe a rarefied air, if you will, and they chase after these things. And so part of the book is is filled with a cautionary tale of why this is an empty pursuit in life. And other parts of the book is are redemptive, telling stories of those that literally had been there, done that, bought the T-shirt, and in some cases been the T-shirt and saw the emptiness of it all. Well, and the book is Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, The Spiritual Biography of Rock and Roll. You know, a lot of people would say, well, there's no, I mean, there's no intersection. There's no gospel roots to rock and roll. There's nothing to see here. What would you say to that? Well, they need to read the book because we did research and actually the roots of rock are gospel. They're gospel, they're blues, they're even somewhat country. So in its first stage, rock was called rockabilly. And it really started in many ways at Sun Records in Memphis, Tennessee, a guy named Sam Phillips was running it. He was looking for an artist that he could use to bring this new sound to people. And it started with Elvis Presley, who came into his studio. And then along after him came Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Carl Perkins, who wrote Blue Suede Shoes. So these guys were the original framers of rock and roll, along with Little Richard, uh, you could include Buddy Holly. You could include even the Everly Brothers. But but these four guys are all Southern boys, Jerry Lee, Johnny, uh, Elvis, and, and uh, Carl. They all, all came from abject poverty. They all came from a church background. They were raised going to church. And they all strayed from it and in varying degrees returned to it later in life. I wrote a whole book about Johnny Cash called Johnny Cash, A Redemption of an American Icon that, by the way, is being made into a documentary film even as we speak and will come out later this year as a Fathom event. But Johnny was raised a Christian. He actually went to uh, Sam Phillips initially and said, I want to be a gospel singer. And he went on to be the king of country music. He strayed from the Lord. He returned to the Lord. Uh, Carl Perkins became a raging alcoholic committed his life to the Lord on a tour. He was on with Johnny Cash. And uh, Jerry Lee is still with us. He's in his 80s now. And he recently talked about the, his, you know, his spiritual concern and his need for God and turning back to God. And Elvis, really a tragic story, dying in his 40s. But there, there are many interesting little insights in Elvis's life. Whenever Elvis was down, he turned to gospel music. And he would sing these gospel songs late into the uh, night with the uh, people in his band. And there was something in Elvis that always returned to the Lord. So, you know, to me, it's interesting that these original framers of what we call rock music today all had gospel roots. Well, and what's so interesting about what you're doing here is you're pulling back the veil, as you were saying, on a lot of these stories. 
I mean, these are incredible stories to look at, especially the redemption stories, right? Because all of us go through different journeys. We all have to find Jesus on our own. We have to make that connection with him. And when you talk about celebrity and fame and rock and roll and this level of it, these people are facing incredibly insane ups and downs. And they're really interesting examples to look at for trying to understand in an extreme sense what that sort of spiritual warfare, what that sort of having to kind of grapple and, and and get back to the roots of faith looks like. So what would you say, and I don't want you to spoil any of the stories, but out of all the stories in the book, when it comes to redemption, what was the one that resonated with you most personally? Well, I think hands down it's Alice Cooper. Because, uh, you know, when you say the name Alice Cooper, people imagine a guy biting the head off a bat. That was actually <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, You know, and you think of the guy with the snake around his neck. Yeah, Alice does that. And his big stage show is theatrics and all that stuff. Well, Alice, at one point, was the number one rock star in all of the world, early 70s. He he started out almost playing a character, Alice Cooper, in this band that was had the same name. He ultimately became Alice Cooper, legally changed his name from Vincent Fernier to Alice Cooper, and he started living the rock star life to excess. He was pretty much drunk every day. He was using drugs heavily. His life began to unravel. His wife, Cheryl, left him. And then one day he put her dresses over the windows of his house to block the sun out and also so no one would see. And he had a rock of cocaine, he told me, the size of a softball. He was snorting it and he looked in the mirror and he said, I saw blood coming out of my eyes. I don't know if it was a hallucination or if it was really happening, but all I knew was I was going to die. And so Alice called out to God. And, you know, Alice's uh, grandfather was an evangelist and his father was a pastor. So he had spiritual roots. He knew it was true. So Alice turned to the Lord. He got off drugs. He reunited with his wife. And he's been clean and sober for over 30 years And so I do an in-depth interview with him in this book, and you can see for yourself, oh, God changed this guy. Now, he still travels and tours as Alice Cooper, really, in the show, portraying this character, but he's very upfront about his faith. He gets up every morning, and he reads his Bible. As he drinks his coffee, he commits his way to the Lord. He told me he gave a Bible to Marilyn Manson. Uh, So he uses his platform to reach other people. He's friends with Johnny Depp and others. Johnny's been in the news a lot, of course, uh, with this trial. And so the point is, God's placed this guy as his representative in a very unlikely place. And so he's just one of many who came to Christ after they reached the pinnacle of fame. You know, when you look at these stories and you mentioned so many details, you know, the drug use and he sort of hits that point where he's looking and he sees his eyes again, whether it was happening or not bleeding. And yeah. he realized I need God. I need to call out to God. When you look at all of these stories, and this is sort of a 30,000 foot view question, but we look at Ephesians 6, we know that we're in this spiritual battle. And when you're in an arena like that, the amount of temptation is so intense yeah. um, for a lot of these artists. What what did you notice? Were there any sort of you know streams of similarity when it came to spiritual warfare or the, or the role of evil um, in the lives of these people as they were journeying through their careers? Yeah, you know, usually they, they didn't come to Christ when they got their first number one record or or when they had their first successful concert, it's usually after they got to the peak and and the problem started, usually related to drug use or alcohol use or maybe both, uh, the breakdown of their marriage or, or some other incident related to the excesses of their life. There's a woman who wrote a book, I quote her in my book, uh, and, and she talks about hitting the high note. And she doesn't literally mean hitting the high note, but she talks about how people who had huge success and in her uh, situation, she was talking about Whitney Houston and Michael Jackson who are frustrated because they can no longer hit the high note, i.e. have that initial surge of excitement that they had when you hear your record on the radio for the first time or you sing for the first time in a stadium of adoring fans or or whatever it is, or you have the platinum record. And so they're always chasing after that high note after. So they turn to drugs. Case in point, uh, Taylor Hawkins, drummer for Foo Fighters. Guy's like 50 years old, just died of a drug overdose. Like, I, you know, I have a chapter in my book called The 27 Club. 
that talks about all these uh, well-known artists who died at the age of 27. Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin later, Kurt Cobain, and Amy Winehouse, 27. But when people are dying at 50 or Tom Petty, uh, you know, you say, wait a second, haven't these guys learned from the people that went before them? But usually they have to hit rock bottom. So, you know, Jesus told us the story of the prodigal son and the boy left his home and he went to a far country. And the story says, Jesus speaking, when that boy came to his senses, he realized, oh, I had it better in my father's house. So I'll return now. Usually they have to come to their senses. And so when this boy came to his senses in the prodigal story, he was literally in a pig pen eating what the pigs ate. So usually it's when they've hit rock bottom, like Alice Cooper and many others I talk about in this book, when they see all those other things are not the answer, sort of process of elimination, and then somehow they're exposed to the gospel, that they make that. Yeah, and... and well, and what does this show us about the power and importance of of rooting our identity where it's supposed to go? I mean, th- this is something that would seem to be at the core of this book as you're as you're presenting these journeys. Well, many of the people that are successful in entertainment in general, rock music, actors and actresses, they're often broken people. And that should not surprise us. Comedians, often very broken people. Um who maybe thought if they made it in Hollywood that they would be happy people. And then when they make it, if they do, and many don't, but if they make it, then they realize, wow, this is not the answer. And and so their lives begin to unravel, but this time they're famous. And so we may hear about it or know about it, but these are just people like we are, that they breathe the same air we breathe. They have the same fears that we have. They have an emptiness in their life. They they have a fear of death. They, they're looking for meaning and purpose. We're all wired that way. It's just that they followed this different path, and maybe they know a little better than the rest of us where the answer is not. But then they have to find where the answer is. We all do. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that's the, that's the core. So, so my last question for you, somebody picks up the book, they pick up Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, and they've finished it. What is your hope for what is stirring in their hearts after that? Well, my hope is that the two takeaway things I would say are, number one, that they would have hope for people they know that don't know Jesus and that they won't give up praying for them. Because no matter how far gone that person you know is, that husband, that son, that daughter, that friend, I I doubt they are more far gone than Alice Cooper was. But uh, you see how God reached out and saved him. And another thing I would say is when you're done with the book, give it to a non-believer to read, especially if they're a rock music fan. And and this is not the kind of book, you know, they would expect you to give them, say, hey, I want to give you this book. Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus, just the cover alone is intriguing, right? And as they start to read it, you know, they'll they'll say, wow, this is uh, not what I was expecting, and, and, and at the end of the book, I present the gospel, and I even have a prayer that a person could pray to accept Christ, because that's really why I do all of this stuff, my books, my movies, my sermons. It's all the same thing. They're just forms of communication, telling stories, pointing people to the gospel, and telling them how to come into a relationship with God. You're a bridge builder, Greg Laurie, and that's and that's what we all need to be. And I so appreciate your time, and I appreciate this book. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Billy.